Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the 10 commandments of the white coat investor. And of course, you know, these are not quite as good as those that were given to Moses, um, but I think you will find them useful in your life. The first one is thou shalt realize thou hast a second job. Most doctors and other high income professionals aren't going to have any sort of a pension. So if you want to retire on more than Social Security, and I assure you that you want to retire on more than Social Security, you're going to need to have some sort of a retirement plan. You are a pension fund manager in our 401k world. If you don't manage it, nobody else is going to. Now, you can hire help. You can hire consultants, let's call them advisors. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own retirement, for your own financial independence. This is a second job. In addition to whatever your main gig is, which I thank you for, don't get me wrong, I'm very appreciative that you do your main job because it's likely a very important one to our society and required a lot of sacrifice for you to do it. But you've got a second one. You've got to take care of your personal finances. All right, commandment number two, thou shalt do continuing financial education. Everybody, no matter whether they choose to rely on a financial advisor or not, needs to do some initial financial education. That means reading three or four good financial books and maybe taking an online course, something like that. But you've got to become financially literate and get a written financial plan in place. That's your initial financial education. And after that, you've got to keep up with it. Now, I think the minimum to do that is to follow a good blog. Obviously, I'm partial to my own and to read a good financial book once a year. That's probably the minimum that it takes to do what I call continuing financial education. Now, there's obviously courses and conferences and lots of other stuff you can do to keep up, um, but that's the minimum. Number three, thou shalt save 20% of your income for retirement beginning the day you leave your training. You know, many companies and municipalities have underfunded their pension plans. The reason why is that they have an unrealistic expectation of ridiculously high future investment returns. Um, you know, and of course, they like to spend money on other stuff as well. Well, as individuals, we're not really any different. The personal pension plans of most Americans are also dramatically underfunded. And the reason why is we don't put enough money toward it. The average American probably needs to be putting 15% of their gross income each year toward retirement. Other savings goals are above and beyond that. College, a house down payment, a Tesla, whatever you want to buy, is in addition to that. However, for a high-income professional like a doctor who gets a late start, pays more in taxes, doesn't have as much of their income replaced by Social Security, you really need to bump that up to about 20% of gross. That's the minimum. That's if you want to retire at a normal retirement age. If you want to retire earlier, it's going to have to be a higher number. So the commandment is 20%. All right, number four. Commandment number four. Thou shalt insure against catastrophe. I'm amazed. People get insurance completely wrong sometimes. They insure against all these little tiny things that are unlikely to happen, and they don't insure against the true financial catastrophes in their lives. Now, let me tell you what the true financial catastrophes are. For most of us, disability is a true financial catastrophe. Most of our value, economically speaking, is our ability to turn money or turn our time into money at a very high rate. We have a specialized set of knowledge or skills. And, uh, and we need to protect that. And the way you do that is disability insurance. Typically, own occupation, specially specific disability insurance. Make sure you get some, okay? Other financial catastrophes. If anybody else relies on that income besides you, you need some term life insurance. And a lot of it, a seven-figure amount, is what you ought to be buying. Liability is a big deal as well. That can be a financial catastrophe. I'm talking about professional liability, you know, malpractice insurance for a physician or dentist, um, but also personal liability. You know, the liability that comes with your auto policy, your homeowner's policy, and you should probably stack a seven-figure umbrella policy on top of that, okay? Uh, accident or illness can be a financial catastrophe as well. Uh, you'd be amazed how quickly I can spend money in the emergency department on you after you have a car wreck. I can spend $10,000 in about 10 seconds. Uh, and if you end up in the ICU, it's probably going to be a six-figure bill. That's a financial catastrophe. You need to insure against it the way you do that is health insurance. Any other expensive property you have, like your home, should also have property insurance on it. If it burns to the ground, that's going to be a financial catastrophe. However, there are lots of things that aren't a financial catastrophe. If you have to bail on your vacation, 
That's not a financial catastrophe. You don't need to buy vacation insurance. Likewise, it's not a financial catastrophe if you drop your iPhone into the toilet, right? You don't need to buy insurance and all these little things in your lives. Uh, you know, Home Depot makes a lot of money off selling you that insurance on the stuff you buy there. It's uh, probably the biggest markup item they have in the store. Um, but you really don't need insurance on your snowblower if you're making 10 or 20 or $30,000 a month. You can afford to go buy a new snowblower. You don't need to insure it. All right, commandment number five, thou shalt not mix insurance and investing. I don't know why, but almost every doctor I know has either been pitched a whole life insurance policy or has already bought one. And as a general rule, these sorts of products offer inferior insurance and inferior investments. It's just not a great combination. And most of the time, you're going to be better off separating them. Buy the insurance you need. I'm a big fan of insurance, but don't buy insurance that you don't need. Part of the issue with something like whole life insurance is it pays off no matter when you die, even if you die at age 92. But when you die at age 92, that's not a financial catastrophe. That's an expected event. You shouldn't need to insure against it. And so you're, in essence, buying insurance you don't need. And that's obviously very expensive. Um, you know, you can see these combined in all kinds of other products, annuities, uh, index universal life. You know, you can even buy, you know, an annuity or life insurance policy primarily to get a long-term care rider. But most of the time, these complex products are products that are designed to be sold, not bought. They pay high commissions and they are so complex that it's difficult for even someone well-versed in the financial world to understand exactly what's going on. I assure you that complexity does not favor the buyer. It favors the seller. Okay, number six, thou shalt favor a passive investing approach. You know, a wise man, Michael LaBeouf, once said, you should invest your time actively and your money passively. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Uh, but the studies have shown pretty clearly that passively managed mutual funds, index mutual funds, over the long run, outperform actively managed mutual funds, especially after tax. And if these professional mutual fund managers can't beat the market, what makes you think that you can do it on your own by analyzing stocks, uh, especially when your analysis generally consists of following along whatever is being put onto Reddit uh, by random people running pump and dump schemes? It just doesn't make sense. The truth of the matter is that you need to make your money primarily with your day job, carve a significant portion of it out, and invest it in a wise way a way that is passive, that is likely to give you market returns over the long term with minimal expenses, minimal taxes, etc. Okay, number seven, thou shalt hire only competent advisors. You know, there are two real problems we have out there with financial advice. The first one is that most financial advice is bad. Most of it is being given by people who are not actually any sort of of fiduciary, highly trained, professional financial advisors. They are not real financial advisors, despite being able to legally call themselves such. That's the biggest problem. There's just a lot of bad advice out there. And it's really product sales masquerading as financial advice. The other problem is that even good advice is often way too expensive. Uh, you don't want to overpay for good advice. The typical going rate for financial planning and investment management is a four-figure amount per year. If you're paying more than $10,000 a year, you can almost surely get just as good or better advice for less money. Uh, it's still expensive stuff, though. So if you can learn how to do this yourself competently, you're going to save that money. And that, of course, compounds over time. So when you go to hire a competent advisor, you're looking for someone with high-level credentials, right? A CFP, a CFA, a CHFC, or if they're coming from the accounting world, a uh, PFS, a personal financial specialist designation, is what you want to see. Uh, you want to make sure the fees are reasonable. You want to make sure they have a fiduciary duty to you. You want to make sure they don't, for some bizarre reason, think their crystal ball isn't cloudy. If their plan for you relies on their ability to predict the future, that's probably not an advisor you want. And of course, you want an advisor that has a bias toward low-cost passive investments because it's been shown quite clearly in the academic literature that those are the winning investments. All right, number eight, thou shalt minimize expenses and taxes. It's amazing how much lower your returns can be 
once you apply investment expenses and taxes. This is something you need to always be cognizant of. You need to understand what the fees are in your 401k and your Roth IRA and your taxable account and any sort of real estate deal you get into. You need to really have those down pat and understand what's too much to pay and what is not. Um, also, your biggest expense is often taxes. So you need to learn about all of the tax protected accounts that are available to you. 401ks, 403bs, 401as, 457bs, individual 401ks, uh, SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, um, you know, HSAs, 529s, ABLE accounts if you have a disabled kid, an education savings account. There are all these accounts out there available to you that allow you to reduce your tax bill now, to reduce the tax drag on your investments, and most of the time, facilitate your estate planning and asset protection at the same time. These are great ways to invest, take advantage of them, know the rules, and for many of you, recognize that you can even have more than one 401k. And yes, if you fund it indirectly or through the back door, you can still use a Roth IRA. Okay, commandment number nine, thou shalt minimize debt and manage necessary debt well. I'm amazed how badly doctors do at managing debt. And I think part of it is because they get used to living on debt while they're in medical school for years. Then they carry this debt throughout a long residency of three to seven years. And by that point, they're kind of debt numb. Um, and so they really kind of need a wake-up call to get rid of that debt at a certain point. Well, let this be your wake-up call. If you've been carrying debt around thinking it's no big deal, you will be amazed how much quickly you're, how much more quickly you uh, build wealth, how much more happy your life is, and what uh, additional risks and career decisions you decide because you don't have to make a bunch of debt payments every month. I'm not saying you can't have debt for anything, but chances are good if you're like most of us here in America, you're carrying way too much debt and paying way too much for it. Credit cards aren't for credit. Okay? They're for convenience. If you're not paying them off at the end of every month, you've shown that you really can't be trusted with a credit card. Stop doing that. Buy your automobiles, RVs, boats, furniture, and vacations with cash. You know, yeah, you can put it on a credit card, pay it off at the end of the month, but don't carry a balance on it. Um, try not to have a mortgage bigger than twice your annual income. Minimize your mortgage interest by putting 20% down, refinancing when rates drop, using a 15-year instead of a 30. Pay off your high-interest student loans. Consider paying off your low-interest student loans as well. A lot of times people are locking themselves into jobs they don't like just because they have student loan payments. Um, refinance those loans uh, anytime you can get a lower rate, so long as you're not attempting to achieve some sort of government forgiveness program. All right, number 10, thou shalt protect thy assets, plan thy estate, and stay the course. And these typically come after getting your investment plan into place, but they're just as important. If you are abandoning your plan every time the market turns down or every time the market gets frothy, as it has been 2020 and 2021, you may uh, you know, regret that. You need to get a plan that you can stick with through thick and thin. You need to also make sure that you've done the reasonable, easy, inexpensive things to protect your assets. Things like maxing out retirement accounts, titling your home and investment accounts as tenants by the entirety if you're married and your state allows that, and making sure that you're not just making these you know, unforced errors when it comes to an asset protection plan. Make sure you have insurance in place. That is the first line of defense. Of course, you want to make sure you have a will, maybe a trust, but go through all your beneficiaries for your insurance policies and for all of your accounts and make sure they're the right beneficiaries. If you've gotten divorced in the last year or two, you probably need to change your beneficiaries. So make sure you pay attention to those details as well. All right, so those are the 10 commandments of the white coat investor. I hope you find that useful.